I'm going to share some things on the spirit of expectation or the, the, the spirit of expectancy. And this is maybe a funny way of saying this, but you know, when Larry did my taxes, I expected them to be right. And you know what? They were. The spirit of expectancy. And actually, before I get right into that, you have got, Jed is one miraculous sound man back there. I was telling him this morning, uh, I said, I may not use all the scriptures I give you. I give scriptures, and then I don't necessarily use them all. And he has them, and he said, no problem. He said, I can just pick them right up. Well, my sound man can't do that. Maybe <laughs> that's, that's a <laughs> that thing, I don't, I don't know what to do about it. I don't want a handheld if I don't I have to. It's too tight there. I think that'll fix it. I don't even know where I was at now. Pardon? Sound man. And he was showing me back there. He said, you give me a scripture. I can have it up there just, before, just about before you're done with saying it. I need, uh, executive, executive, I need Exodus 15, 26. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A little slow. Nine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I had no intentions of counting that off, but it just came to my mind. Okay, Jed? <laughs> He's laughing back there. Where it takes Kevin, and I, I, I thought to myself, I need to bring Kevin out here and let him talk to Jed. <laughs> because it may take 20, 25 seconds for, for Kevin to get a scripture up. I'm not knocking Kevin. Maybe our system. But... Uh, uh, I told, told Jed, I said, you know, I have, a, I have an expectancy that if I give you, or, or in this case, Kevin, a scripture, you ought to be able to get it up there pretty easy. Now, I'm non-technological except co concerning heating systems, John. Uh, <laughs> we were in a motel. <laughs> John's in one room, I'm in the other, it's toasty warm, it's winter time. John's getting colder and colder and colder, and he said, something's wrong, something's not working. What was wrong? You hadn't turned it on? So we laugh because I'm really not technological at all. So, hallelujah. We have a blood covenant, people. You are a blood covenant person. Your God is a blood covenant physician. You have, you are a part of a blood covenant. And in the Old Testament, the blood covenant provided three real basic things. And that was protection from your enemies, protection from pestilence, and what this one here, the last thing this says uh, freedom from disease. Those were, how about that? And then you go over to like Hebrews 7.22. It says, we, are, we have the surety of a better covenant. We got something better than that. And Hebrews 8.6 goes right along with that. We've got a better covenant than what they had. We've got a blood covenant. But our blood covenant is permanent. They had to go back every year, so to speak, or every time period. Jesus paid the price permanently for you and me. You know, and, and you say, well, okay, protection from our enemies. Enemies can be a lot of different things, not just the ISIS, okay? Not just ISIS. We, have, we can have enemies around us, and our enemies are not people. It's the devil that works through them, or they allow to work through them. Say, well, well you don't understand this person I know. The devil's working through him. What he needs is Jesus. We all need Jesus, don't we? He says he desires it all come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I didn't have this down, and he didn't have it in his notes. That's why I had asked the scripture to be put up there, that we have a blood covenant. Everything about our life as a believer is, comes right out of that covenant. Without a co There's no covenant without the shedding of blood. Jesus paid that price. That blood read down the cross. And so we have a great, great deal. When we get saved, we start having expectations. Expectancy begins to come in our life, or should. One of the things that I have found out is I've talked, and I've talked about expectation all over the world. Expecting. One of the things is people are afraid to. Don't be one of those people. 
God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear has no place in yours and my life. It's already been defeated. You say, well, I don't feel like it. We need to take our authority. We have authority. He's given us power of attorney. We have the right to walk all over him. Serpents and scorpions are no problem whatsoever. He's a loser. I'm a winner. Period. Done. When I ministered in England, I was using the word period. It doesn't mean the same thing to them as it does to me. Well, that was something else. About halfway through my sermon, I thought, what is wrong? They are not getting what I'm saying. And so I stopped and asked. Mike, they said, over here, <laughs> when we say, okay, it's done, period, that's it. With them, it's just a continuation. <laughs> Whoa. That really makes a difference in a message, John. <laughs> <laughs> it just <laughs> really doesn't do good things for it. But having a spirit of expectation, having that spirit in your life and knowing it's in your life. Mark 11. Probably shouldn't be doing this because now I'm going to have a problem. Mark 11, 1. <laughs> 24, you've got it there. You know you got it. Don't play games with me, Jed. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. If I take and read this, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. Wouldn't that give me a little bit of expectation? And he says I'd have them. Why would we pray or say if we don't expect? Think about it for a minute. Because really Mark eleven twenty four 24 is pray, believe, and receive. Well, if I pray, I think John, uh, I think it was John that said something concerning Larry. Larry believed it. When he went and laid hands on you, when he ministered to you, he believed the results were coming forth. That's why six people walked out of the hospital alive. Because he believed it. It's not that doubt may not try to enter in. We don't have to live in doubt. We take authority over it. Say, no way. No way. I'll not have this. This is what the Word says. This is what my life is based on. When I see something in the Word, I can expect it to be true. God said in, Ma in, in Malachi uh, 3, 6, I'm not a man that I should lie. So if he says it, and he's not a man, he should lie, and I serve God, then I should be able to believe, expect what he says to take place in my life or whatever I'm speaking or saying. Right? Yes. Pray, believe, and receive is for you and me. I have to ask myself the question. Do I believe it? Many times if we well, man, that's, that's, I don't know. Then we go back to the Word and see what the Word has to say. And say, Father, your Word says. You know, when we were little kids, or those of you that have little kids now, when you tell them something, they believe it. Isn't that right? Whether it's being a parent or, like in our case, a grandparent. Even at 11 years old, my, my, our youngest grandson, you know, when granddad tells him something, he believes it. Well, if he can believe me, how much more should we be able to believe God? I mean, he reminds me of something. He likes to go to the juice stop. And, I, and he said, Granddad, can we stop at the juice stop? And I said, well, I can't today, but, but we will the next time you're with Granddad. You know what he did the next time? <laughs> he remembered that Granddad said we're going to stop at the juice stop. You know, grandparents are kind of softies anyway. Thursday before Thanksgiving, uh, Lake and his mom took us out to eat. But we went to see a, um, Mary and I went to see a movie before that, and we got to their house and went inside, and, and uh, right away he said to me, Granddad, come to my bedroom. I said, okay, we get in the bedroom, and he closes the door. And he said, Granddad, can you give me $15 so I can give it to Mama for Valentine's Day? <laughs> I mean, how could a granddad say no to a kid that's so wonderful? 
<laughs> Actually, it ended up costing me 18, 17. So he had three dollars, and uh, so we got it worked out. Now, the, uh, the funny part of this is, Mary was at at their house when when um, he had taken oh made a very uh, awesome. I haven't seen it. Uh, Valentine's card for his mom and then at the and it said something you always do things for me I want to do this for you I love you mama and so on and then he had an envelope taped to the bottom well in the envelope was the $15 or $20 and she Nicole was so excited you know thank you late you know and and he never said anything about where it came from or anything like that which he shouldn't have you know when you give something I got $20 in my pocket I'm not giving it to you See it? I got it from John. He didn't give it to me. I got to pay it back. Yeah. <laughs> but when, he, when I gave that to him, whose money was it? His. Did he have to justify where it came from? You know, every time you buy groceries, do you say to the clerk, well, I got this from working. <laughs> well, doesn't that sound kind of stupid? <laughs> well, he never said a word. Well, Mary didn't know that I had given him the money until Sunday morning in church when I shared it. <laughs> she said, well, he didn't even say anything to his mom. I said, he didn't have to. It was his money. Well, but he got, I said, Mary, it was his money. We had to go around right in church on this. <laughs> and people were agreeing with me and not with her. Praise God. And, <laughs> you know, but I got off my story on that. But, but he, you know, I'm going to tell you something. He expected granddad to say yes to the $15. In the same way, he expected me to take him to juice stop. When God says to you and me, I meet all your needs according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus, I expect that, you know what? When he says, call him to me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things, Jeremiah 33, 3, I expect that. He said it, I expect it. When he says in Romans 10, I think it's 13, that uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall go to hell. That's not what it says, is it? I thought somebody would at least shout out, no! <laughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, made whole. I expect that, people. When his word says it, I expect it, don't you? You know, I, I tell the people at, at home, you know, I still want to take these off <laughs> when I'm not looking, but then I'm going to have John back up here again. <laughs> I tell the people, listen, can't you hear that financial blessing coming down the canyon? Hear it rumble towards you? You know, it's like, you know, when, when water is running down a canyon, how it sounds, you can hear it for a long ways, you know it's coming. That's your finances. You prayed, you believe, and you'll receive. I expect it to manifest. In the same way I expect healing or anything else to manifest. That I'm praying and believing for according to the word of God. A spirit of expectation. Get up in the morning. I have people say, what kind of a day is it there? I tell them it's absolutely beautiful. It doesn't matter what it is. To me, it's a beautiful day. I called Dave Dwell a couple of months ago. I said, man, Dave, it's 71 degrees here. And he said, Dwayne, you're kidding. I said, not at all. I'm looking at my thermometer in the house here. <laughs> he said, I'm going to use that on Bonnie. Do I have the spirit of expectation, the expectancy about me? Do I expect what I say, what I pray to come to pass? We all ought to be nodding our heads, yes. Otherwise, why are we saying it? You know, and he tells us in Matthew, uh, I think it's Matthew 12, that uh, uh, idle words you are accountable for. And so if you're just saying something to be saying something, what's the purpose? Who are you trying to impress? Or when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, be sure you want to pray. Be sure you want to go 
come to the Lord? Do I expect what I say? Do I expect what I say to come to pass? Do I allow myself the freedom to expect? My dad didn't. My dad was bound up with a type of fear. He grew up down at Elm Springs, you know, with nothing. And he just, he never quite got out. That he made good money in his life, but he never quite got out. He never got himself to where he could expect to have something more. I'm not knocking my daddy. He didn't know any better and never, it just was that way. But thank God, John, we have the possibility of ex- not only a, a possibility, but the reality of expecting more. Spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, socially, doesn't matter. Expect more. When I come out here, when I was out here for my aunt's funeral back, I think in April, the Margie Angles, 102, as I was leaving uh, the fellowship afterwards, here comes somebody running at me. Bucky, Bucky, Bucky! <laughs> I've not been called that in a long time, except by people that knew me when I was a kid here. My dad didn't like my mom naming me Dwayne, and he called me Buck. And I went with that for until I started high school here in Sturgis, my ninth grade. She said, I know you're not called that anymore, but she said, I couldn't think what it is. <laughs> it was a girl that lived next door to us out at Marcus. You know, we have a name, and our father knows it. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. There's nothing you can hide. You may think you can hide something. Let me tell you, you can't. He knows it all. He knows everything about you. So I say to you, dream big dreams. I can remember as a kid, people say, well, you shouldn't daydream. Let me tell you, I daydream. Their words had no impact on me, John. I dream. I dream big dreams. I dream big dreams. If I told almost anybody, they'd say, you are absolutely nuts. Things that I want to do for Jesus Christ. Things I want to do to help my family. Things I want to do to help the church. People in the church. I've got big dreams. You say, well, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Well, let me tell you something. If I'm, not big, if I'm not dreaming big dreams, if I'm not believing for big things, it's not going to happen. I set my mind on it. You know, just like John and myself in starting a church. Let me tell you, you go through a lot of things starting a church. John has the building downtown, the glass shop. I have a uh, uh, odd fellows run down, beat up building that we hold church in with a plastic casket in the back that God told me that I took authority over five spirits every Sunday morning. We dealt with a lot of things. But look at the wonderful thing that God has given John and Elisa because they paid the price. There's a price to anything. Larry paid a price. Paid a big price and sometimes. But you know what? He didn't really look at it that way, and neither do we look at it that way. You know, you said hard, meaning uh, intense. You know, we, I don't even think, and I know John doesn't either. Man, this is hard. People will say something, oh, it's just so hard. No, it's not. Submit and let God lead you through. Have a spirit of expectancy about it. Dream big dreams. Have big thoughts. Talk success to yourself. You maybe can't talk it to somebody else, but you can talk it to yourself. I'm going to share this, and not one of you will ever tell my wife. I will whoop up on you like a chicken on a June bug. One day I told my wife, I am absolutely tired of believing for thousands and millions. I'm going to start believing for billions and trillions, and boy, did that set her off. There was no way. She said, you're crazy. You don't even have the thousands and, and, and millions. I said, but I'm getting them. I'm getting them. And one day I shared that. She said, please don't share that again. Because it makes her look bad. Okay. 
<laughs> but, you know, people say, well, how in the world could you, how can you even phantom a billion? Because I've been thinking about it for 40 years or longer. See, are you ever going to have a billion? Yes. I am. Let me tell you, when it happens, she'll enjoy it too. And then I will very carefully say, told you so. <laughs> Spirit of expectation. Do I think about it all the time? No. But ever so often, just begin to think about it and begin to praise God. Father, I thank you. It's all coming to pass. Thousands, millions, billions, trillions. It means nothing to him. It's in here that it, the meaning is. My dad, bless his heart, never got out of the thousands, low thousands. He never could wrap anything around more. He never saw himself having more. A lot of people, even believers, are that way. We have to break those old things. We've got to go beyond them. Philippians 4.13. Plan great plans. What does it say? Read it to me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God loves somebody that will take a stand on the impossible. Because he is the solver of all impossibilities. That's why you listen and hear. And I do this, people. Probably every day or two, I listen for the sound coming down the canyon. My finances are rumbling down that canyon just like water in a flood. Or whatever else it might be that you have a need of. You all know Philippians 4.8, and these are certainly six things to, to meditate on. To keep in your spirit. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, on, or what are, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Things looking rough for you? Start thinking on these things. True things, honest things, just things, pure things, lovely things, things of a good report. God brings a good report. He's a God that brings it. Things you and I can expect. Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4. Favor of God and man. Favor with God and man. Let not mercy, mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. I can expect that. Years and years ago, actually before I ever met John, I really felt that I'd be doing some, some ministry in, in, uh, out here where I, where I grew up. Uh, maybe some out-of-town Bible. So I didn't know. I just felt impressed to come out. But I needed a meeting place here in, in Sturges to do a, a two-day service. And I, I didn't know where to go. I'm, I'm very green. And finally somebody told me, he said, go see the fire chief. They've got this room they let people use. So I finally got the fire chief. I don't know if he's still him, but it was a volunteer man. I told him what I wanted, and when I got done, he told me why he couldn't give it to me. He said, first of all, we don't give it two days in a row to anybody. Well, I'm, as he's telling me, and he went for five minutes telling me why he could not let me have that space. I'm just there under my breath looking at him and smiling and listening with respect, saying, Father, I thank you. I have favor with this man. And the last sentence he says, but we'll work it out for you. <laughs> Never used it, but I mean, that's called favor. Favor with God and man. I've had other things, but that's one that always sticks out in my heart, was this guy was telling me for five minutes why I couldn't have it. And his last sentence was, but we can work it out for you. God is so great. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Be a giver. Be a giver. Look for ways. Look for places to give. I have a friend that, that's a, a traveling evangelist says, I give every day. When I go to the office in the morning, if I can't find something else to give, I take a pen and give it away to somebody. I'll be out eating, and somebody's getting ready to sign. I said, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Here, use my pen. I want to give this to you today. Really? Thank you. 
but I got a pen. It's okay. I need to sow something today, and I'm sowing it into your life. Always look for places and ways to give, precious people. Always look for ways and places. Be a giver, not a taker. There's a whole lot of Christians that are takers. And be a tipper. My brother-in-law and I were in a Chinese restaurant we eat at in Sioux Falls a couple of weeks ago. I noticed two grown ladies and a child, a little boy maybe four, five, six, eating full meals. And when they left, I looked over. I didn't see them leave, but when I left, it looked like they'd put a dollar for a tip. That really bothers me, okay? It really bothers me. I, I, I didn't under, grow up understanding how to give, but I learned how to give. And I said to my brother-in-law, he said, you ready to go? I said, no, not yet. I, and so it was on the way to the bathroom, which I didn't need to go. But I wanted to walk by and see, was that really a dollar? It wasn't. There was two. I went back and sat down. Server came, and I said, would you tell me who is, this, who is the, um, uh, the server for that table? And she said, it was me. And I said, well, I want to apologize for their cheapness. And I said, uh, here's, here's $5. And she said, oh, you don't have to do that. And I said, okay, thank you. Put it back. Well, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I, yeah, I want it. And Jeff, had, my brother-in-law, had just ministered to her a couple of weeks before on something very much like that. And I said, you know, it's wrong what they did. I can't, I can't help what they did. But I could do something about it from my perspective today. You, you think she was kind of excited about that? People like to be blessed. Is there anybody in here that doesn't like to be blessed? If you, if you don't like to be blessed, please raise your hand. John will pray for you. We all want to be blessed. But as Kenneth Hagin says, one of the reasons that I see that most are that Christians that aren't being blessed aren't being blessed is because they haven't planted anything to start with. They're cheap. They're tight. When we understand that as we give, we receive, it ought to make all of us want to give. 1 Peter 2.24 Live unto righteousness, righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. I can expect that, precious people. I can expect that. Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know what? I want to have a merry heart. I got a merry wife. I want a merry heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. And in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. I can expect. You know, there's not anything I could do that would cause John not to love me. Now, I know I'm a deep personality, so I just know he is anyway. But, but there's not anything I could do or that he could do that would cause us not to love one another. Hi, Marty. Didn't see you earlier. So I say to you, keep your expectancy alive and well in your life. I'm going to share just a little bit more here and then stop. When nothing seems to work in your life, what's the first thing you ought to do? Praise. Start praising. God loves praise. He inhabits the praises of his people. He loves you. When things don't seem to be going right, don't look at the things aren't going right. Start praising him and thanking him that the situation is changing. God loves you. He's for you. Just like we're for our children. He's even for us more. I think the last time I was here... I told you about cat allergy. I had a cat allergy. Anybody remember me telling you that? And I was out at my, I've had it, people. This is embarrassing. I've had that thing bother me for 40 years. I played with cats as a kid, but along about 25, 30 years old, cats and I decided that we were not going to like each other anymore. And the only cat I ever saw should be a dead cat. Now, don't get upset at me if you got cats. I got a lady with four cats in my church. And I get her every cat joke I can find. 
The dog on a leash said to the cat that's not on a leash, you know why you're not on a leash? They want you to run away. <laughs> I'm in full agreement. <laughs> Hallelujah. I need help again. I lost where I was on that rabbit track. Oh yeah, the cat allergy, thank you. I was out at my cousin Danny's out north of Red Owl uh, back uh, in April, staying there, and I went into the bedroom and laid down, and I mean, I had a fire attack. If you've had allergies with cats or something like that, my eyes just went, I mean, just extremely painful. I'm laying there, you know, being a man of God, you know exactly what to do. I said, well, I, I got blankets. I could go sleep outside in my car. It's warm enough. Brilliant thinking. I could go to the couch in their house, but the cat's been on that thing too. And then I finally got smart after 40 years and said, why do I put up with this? Why am I putting up with this? And instantly I took authority over that thing. In the name of Jesus Christ, I commanded that to leave. Within a split second, the fire was gone from my eyes. I went to sleep and slept all night. Never had a problem. So I told it. told it told it at home and so on. I'm back at Danny's house Thursday night. First time I've really been around cats. They don't have cats in the house, all they do, but they're not, they got all over the place. And I'm at the table after we eat, and I can feel my eyes, okay? And then I go to the bedroom, and oh man, that thing hit. I did not decide to go outside. I did not decide to go to the couch. I decided to do the same thing that I did before, and I reminded the devil, I kicked you out and get out of here right now. And instantly it all left. Isn't, I mean, it's just, isn't that just a great God? I could expect it to happen. I could have expected it 40 years ago, precious people. I put up with that thing for 40 ugly, long, cat-infested years. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want to love cats either, but, <laughs> but I think it's a great testimony. You know, and I, you know, you say, well, did you expect it the first time you prayed? I don't know what, I mean, you know, I don't know. But I can guarantee you, when I was there Thursday night, I expected that garbage to leave instantly. And it did, just like it had before. And 40 years ago, it would have too. We put up with a lot of stuff, people, that we don't have to put up with. Just begin to praise him. I laid in bed there, prayed in tongues, and thanked him. I'm delivered. What, as, you know, as the blood, we, we had three things that I started with on the blood covenant. We're blood covenant people. What was number one that the blood covenant provides you? Pardon? Protection from your enemies. Number two? From pestilence. Number three was healing all your diseases. A guarantee. I could expect it. I doubt that I'll ever have a, tack, a cat attack again. But I can assure you that if it even starts to attack at the kitchen table, I'll deal with it right then. I won't even wait till I get to the bedroom and it becomes a severe thing. We can expect precious people. But I say, praise. Praise God. Things aren't going right, don't seem to be going right, not seeming to work right. Just begin to praise Him. Not because of the junk. Praise Him because you love Him. Praise Him because He's your deliverer. God loves the praise of His people. Oh, hallelujah. Just begin to sing and praise Him and honor Him. Remember, He is, he is the God. He's not a God. He's the God. He's the only God we serve. What a, what a, what a powerful, awesome um, thing on that. But when the light starts to try to dim in some situation in our life, turn the praise on and watch the light shine bright. I love you. I bless you. I appreciate you. And thank you so much for letting me share on the spirit of expectation. You are winners and not losers. Expect that. Expect that. You are a winner. The victory is yours and mine. We have the privilege of walking in it, breathing it day in and day out. We sing the songs that are victorious. 
You know, so thank you. I love you and bless you.